Support for Ben Franklin's World and the Doing History to the Revolution series comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture and Care.com Senior Care. In the House of Representatives, June 17, 1774. This House, having duly considered and being deeply affected with the unhappy differences which have long subsisted and are increasing between Great Britain and the American colonies, do resolve that a meeting of committees from the several colonies on this continent is highly expedient and necessary to consult upon the present state of the colonies and the miseries to which they are and must be reduced by the operation of certain acts of Parliament respecting America, and to deliberate and determine upon wise and proper measures to be by them recommended to all the colonies for the recovery and establishment of their just rights and liberties, civil and religious, and the restoration of union and harmony between Great Britain and the colonies, most ardently desired by all good men. Therefore resolved that the Honorable James Bowden Esquire, the Honorable Thomas Cushing Esquire, Mr. Samuel Adams, John Adams and Robert Treat Payne Esquires, be and they are hereby appointed a committee on the part of this province for the purposes aforesaid to meet such committees or delegates from the other colonies in the city of Philadelphia on the first day of September next, and that the Speaker of the House be directed in a letter to the speakers of the House of Burgesses or Representatives in the several colonies, to inform them of the substance of these resolves. Signed, Samuel Adams, Clerk. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present-day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Kovar. On June 17, 1774, the Massachusetts General Court, or Colonial Assembly, resolved that there needed to be a meeting of committees from the several colonies to consult upon the present state of the imperial crisis. The General Court suggested that this Colonial Assembly meet in Philadelphia on September 1, 1774, and it made copies of its resolve to send his invitations to the other 12 colonies to attend. This Massachusetts Bay resolve called for the creation and meeting of what we know now as the First Continental Congress. By June 1774, it had become clear to the revolutionaries in Massachusetts and in the other colonies that some coordinated action between the colonies was necessary in order to stage a bigger, more organized opposition to what they viewed as Parliament's increasingly autocratic governance of the American colonies. And this realization and development raises important questions about the American Revolution. How did the American colonies organize and coordinate intercolonial action? And since we know how the revolution played out, we need to wonder how this coordinated intercolonial action paved the way for revolutionary governance at the local, colony, and intercolonial levels. To find answers to our questions, we should start by investigating one of the earliest efforts to gather and organize information and to coordinate action against Parliament's measures. We should begin by investigating the Boston Committee of Correspondence, which formed in November 1772. Now, before Mark Boonshoff became an assistant professor of history at Norwich University in Vermont, he served as a postdoctoral research fellow at the New York Public Library, where he helped to digitize and contextualize the minutes of the Boston Committee of Correspondence. Mark knows these committee records well, which means he should be able to help us start answering our questions. Mark, thanks so much for joining us and for helping us with our investigation. 
Now, as you know, we're trying to better understand how the American colonies organized and coordinated intercolonial action during the American Revolution. And one of the first organizational bodies patriots formed during the revolution was the Boston Committee of Correspondents. So would you tell us about this committee and why and when it formed? Sure thing, Liz. The Boston Committee of Correspondents formed in the fall of 1772, which I think is a really critical moment in what we call the imperial crisis, because it's a point at which it seemed to a lot of people that the sense of crisis had sort of abated for a time. So if you think about your high school history level narrative of the coming of the revolution, there's a lot of action in the 1760s from the Treaty of Paris in 63 to the Sugar Act in 64, the Stamp Act in 65, the Towns and Duties in 67, the repeal of the Towns and Duties coming in 1770 with the Boston Massacre. But then the next sort of event we really tend to think of is the Tea Act and then the Tea Party in 1773. So the Boston Committee, I think, is really significant for getting us from that initial burst of tension to sort of the domino rally really falling and resistance becoming a revolution in the mid-1770s. And the way I think of what the Boston Committee did was it was formed by a group of people in Boston, sort of radical people led by the likes of Samuel Adams, who actually worried a lot about this kind of calm that seemed to happen after the massacre. And basically, they really believed that there was a conspiracy to deprive colonists of their rights. And in Massachusetts in particular, it was being enacted by Governor Hutchinson. And so this calm, for lack of a better word, made people complacent. It sort of could be viewed that people were allowing these policies to happen, right? The duty on tea is still active. And so these folks are basically looking for both a way to get people reinvigorated about politics, to reawaken them to their political virtue, their need to protect their rights. And they gin up this idea of committees of correspondence, but they need an excuse, really, to institute this innovation. And they get that wish, again, in the fall of 1772, when there's a British policy passed. It's a really convoluted thing. It's not all that well understood or often talked about, but it's really important, which is British decide that the judges of the Massachusetts Superior Court are going to be paid by the crown as opposed to by the Massachusetts Assembly, which had long been the tradition. And to people like Adams, this reeks of an attempt to undermine judicial independence, to make judges beholden to the empire as opposed to the people the courts are supposed to serve. And so that's the sort of issue that they latch on to justify creating committees of correspondence. And they're very deliberate about it being about correspondence, because the goal at this point is, again, reawakening people to the fact that there is this conspiracy to deprive them of their rights, that they need to actively guard against future policies that might undermine those rights. And so correspondence and communication is obviously critical for that kind of thing. Richard D. Brown, who wrote a really fabulous book on the Boston Committee called Revolutionary Politics in Massachusetts, He argues that their main goal is to educate people and to sort of create a common community, some unity throughout Massachusetts Bay to sort of reinvigorate the resistance toward British policy. So the Boston Committee of Correspondence was really a populist body. And what I mean by that is it was formed not by one of the legal governing bodies, say the Massachusetts General Court or the Governor's Council, but by a concerned group of Bostonians who were worried about what was going on around them. That's absolutely right. So if you think about it, It kind of had to be done that way because those other institutions you mentioned, the Massachusetts General Court, the Governor's Council, these are institutions that have some allegiance to the crown. They're constituted by a charter that is sort of granted by the empire. And so it needs to happen in a different way. It has to happen sort of outside of those institutions. And so the ideas for the committees come from individuals, you know, the kind of classic Boston Whigs we think about, James Otis, Samuel Adams, Joseph Warren, Benjamin Church, and so on. But they do still need, they think, to do this within an institution that people trust to get it legitimacy. And so they can't do it necessarily through the general court. So they do it through the town meeting. And they first sort of exhaust constitutional mechanisms. They actually ask Hutchinson to sort of justify the salary thing, to call an assembly into session, to talk about it. When those fail, they feel that they can make this innovation. And that's a dirty word in the period of innovation, that they can make this innovation and call this committee. And so it's the Boston town meeting that they do it in. And even, in fact, William Cooper, who was the clerk of the town meeting, became the clerk of the Boston Committee of Correspondence. And this turns out to be a really smart move and one of the strengths of the Committee of Correspondence in Boston, but also Committees of Correspondence throughout Massachusetts, because the town meeting is a pretty democratic 
pretty accessible, at least for the time and for white men. And in acting this through the town meeting, they convey a kind of popularity and legitimacy around it that it might not otherwise have, it being the Boston Committee of Correspondence. So there was some overlap between the membership of the Boston Town Meeting and the Committee of Correspondence. Would you tell us more about who served on the Boston Committee of Correspondence and what governing powers or powers at all that the committee men exercised? So the committee's kind of bailiwick was defined in this town meeting resolution that creates it. So they opt to create a 21-person committee, and their powers are described or their role is described in that resolution. And I'm just going to quote from it. It says, this committee is empowered, quote, to state the rights of the colonists and of this province in particular as men, as Christians, and as subjects, and then to communicate and publish the same to the several towns in this province and to the world. And I'm going to skip ahead a little. Also, they're empowered to request of each town a free communication on their sentiments on this subject. So in that sense, their role is explicitly tied to this question of sort of rights and liberties that's being raised by British policies, the tensions brewing out of this imperial crisis. And their other role is to sort of forge a correspondence, to convey those sentiments and to find out what other towns and other localities think. So in that same resolution, they appoint the 21 men to this committee. They're kind of the usual suspects, well-to-do fellows, lawyers, many of them, a lot of Harvard graduates. But what, again, Richard Brown, I'll cite again, he says that really what unites them is that all of the men appointed to this committee are known for being sympathetic to the growing resistance movement, to the Boston Whigs. And so unsurprisingly, Samuel Adams' name is right on top of the list. Did any of the names on the committee's membership list reflect that the committee opened up political participation to non-elite American men? And maybe if not the Boston committee, we know that there were committees of correspondence in other colonies. So maybe their membership lists reflect this? It's a great question, Liz. Active participation that is sort of taking on leadership roles sort of remained with a well-to-do group. But new opportunities presented themselves just by the sheer number of offices that needed to be held. So you got to a level below that of the people who had traditionally held offices. So one example is that in South Carolina, the provincial Congress that is created has three times as many seats as the old provincial assembly. So, I mean, there's three times as many people who are going to have to hold office. All told, I've seen one estimate that the committees called around 7,000 men, various committees, to sort of serve on those committees to make them function. So in that sense, I think it does create some level of new opportunity. Of course, it's still confined to white men, literate white men, you know, relatively well-known people. But it's more people than had been holding political office in, you know, 1762. Now, how did committees of correspondence like the Boston Committee work? Do we know what kinds of communication networks they formed and what types of information they shared? So there are sort of two networks that they form. So again, the Boston Committee is really focused at the outset with communicating with the rest of Massachusetts. And so they create this network within the colony, basically. So they more or less communicate with the other towns or districts, and that's the network that they form. On the other hand, as the idea sort of gets going, There's a notion that there also need to be intercolonial networks, that is, networks of communication between colonies, not only within Massachusetts Bay. And it's really Virginia that takes the lead on this. So the Virginia House of Burgesses creates a committee of correspondence that is deliberately supposed to represent the whole of Virginia. And so they then write to other colonies trying to get them to do the same, which they eventually do. Even Massachusetts makes a Massachusetts Committee of Correspondence for a time, although that one fizzles out relatively quickly. And the Boston Committee ends up taking on the kind of colony-wide role for Massachusetts, too. But so you can think of there being two separate networks happening. One is this intra-Massachusetts thing that the Boston Committee is initially trying to create, trying to awaken the countryside to the upsetting policies that the British are imposing, especially in Boston. And then slowly but surely, during 1773, there become intercolonial committees. And these all sort of prefigure different things. In a lot of ways, you can think of the various Massachusetts town committees leading into what will become the provincial Congress, so that will represent the whole state. And in these intercolonial committees are really prefiguring the Continental Congress that will eventually meet in 1774. The committees of correspondence were really designed to share information and ideas about politics and to kind of coordinate a response to certain imperial political measures. Mark, 
Were committees of correspondence like the Boston Committee successful in spreading and encouraging broader support for revolutionary politics? I think they were. You know, there's a lot going on in the early to mid 1770s, and it's often hard to sort of say who or what institution is driving any given event. But I think that we can generalize and say that the Boston Committee successfully established like a model, a model of how to create a popular mechanism for communication, correspondence, and coordination that gets used in many different ways. So again, there's the fact that all these Massachusetts towns respond. There's the fact that every colony creates a committee of correspondence after Virginia does that. And so I think in that sense, they're really critical for creating something like a common cause because there is all of this correspondence and now awareness of what's going on in different places. The other thing I would say is that it seems pretty clear to me that people involved in the revolutionary movement throughout the 13 colonies look to the Boston Committee of Correspondence as a sort of you know, guru institution on building communications infrastructure. And I think the most obvious example of this is there's an effort to establish a post office, a separate new post office that's not controlled by the British Empire. The idea for this post office comes from a guy named William Goddard, who's a printer. He's probably less famous than his sister, Mary Catherine Goddard, who was commissioned by the Continental Congress to print a copy of the Declaration of Independence. And hers was actually the first printing to include the names of the signers. She's rightfully a little bit more famous. But anyway, to the point, William Goddard comes up with this idea and he brings the idea to the Boston Committee and he asks them to help him generate support for it and generate some funding for it. And that's exactly what they do. They write to other towns and to other committees and to other people trying to say that, you know, this guy Goddard is on to something and you should lend him support, if not money. And I also think in a similar way, the plan for the post office sort of takes some inspiration from the committee. It's decentralized in a way that mimics the Boston committee. So this post office, the proposed post office, would be controlled by printers and merchants, the men and women who depended on it, right? In the same way that the Boston committee and the other committees of correspondence were drawing on the strengths of the towns to generate legitimacy. And so it mimics the extra legal workings of the committee, and it ultimately proves pretty successful. Now, by May 12, 1777, the Boston Committee of Correspondence had become the Committee of Correspondence, Inspection, and Safety. And many committees of correspondence, it seems, had given way to committees of safety by 1777. Mark, would you tell us about the committees of safety? Why did they begin to form, and did they operate and function any differently from committees of correspondence? I like to think of this this way. The committee as an organizational unit was basically a constant in revolutionary America. Americans were sort of obsessed with committees. They still are to a certain degree. We have in Congress a committee on committees, but this really maybe gets going in the revolutionary moment. So the point is that the committee is the organizational form that patriots default to, but they create different committees for different purposes at different times as they're needed. So the heyday of committees of correspondence was 1772 to 1774, because at that moment, the challenge was, as I've said before, re-energizing opposition to British policy, reawakening people to the threat at hand, and sort of forging a united opposition to that through creating networks. And, you know, the first step is communication. But after 1774, or by the end of 1774, the patriot movement, such as it was, their needs really had changed because the committees of correspondence had been so successful, more or less. In some sense, the First Continental Congress rendered the committees of correspondence relatively obsolete because there was now a meeting that was going to happen so people could exchange ideas and communicate through this meeting in Philadelphia. But once that happens and the revolution itself or the resistance, I guess, at this point, the resistance is getting more formalized, the problem changes and the problem becomes political allegiance and policing it, right? So as the resistance movement becomes more institutionalized, they have to worry about opposition. And the First Continental Congress passes something called the Articles of Association, which really, I think, drives the shift from committees of correspondence to committees of safety. So the Articles of Association, you know, the Continental Associations it's sometimes known, was agreed to at the First Continental Congress by the 12 colonies that attended. Georgia didn't. And they agree it's to not import British goods, not to export British goods. And if the sort of tensions are still there, eventually to actually not consume any of these British goods. But that has to be enforced. And so the association has this provision that suggests that the committees of correspondence and the county-wide committees 
actually act. They call it to inspect is their word. But basically to enforce this boycott, to make sure no one's skirting the association and thereby like undermining patriot unity. So in Boston, they actually create a whole separate committee of safety and inspection. But in many places, it's the committees of correspondence that just take on this new role, which is it's sort of enforcing allegiance, enforcing the one main thing that all the colonies can do to resist what the British are doing, and that is economic boycotts. If these committees of safety intended to enforce this continental association or economic boycott, then they would have needed power. And we associate power with governance. So it seems like at some point, these committees of safety would have had to claim and exercise the power of legitimate governing bodies. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fair to say. Again, I think that's a product of this shift. The committees of safety, the committees of inspection, has to more or less enforce policies that the Continental Congress is passing, things like the association. But they have this sticky problem of no one's really sure what their status is, same as the Continental Congress. Like, are they legitimate? Are they governing institutions? So yes, they do have to function as governing institutions. They have to sort of police what actually dissent means, what non-cooperation is. But before they do that, they have to sort of render themselves legitimate. So they end up taking on these governmental functions where they can. And the committees that are successful are the ones that come to be seen as legitimate. And it seems like the time it would have taken to be seen as a legitimate governing body would have varied by location. I happen to know in Albany, New York, that it took the people there until 1776 before the Committee of Safety actually supplanted the Common Council, which was the legitimate governing body for the city. But there weren't many British soldiers around. The New England and Green Mountain Boys had captured Fort Ticonderoga in May 1775, and the nearest British forces were really in Canada at that point. So it was probably easier for the revolutionaries in Albany to declare the Committee of Safety their government than it was for the revolutionaries in places with a closer proximity to British forces. Yeah, I mean, that makes perfect sense. I think, you know, the fight becomes at the local level a question of how you view the rightful source of power and how you view various institutions. So if you are someone who was sympathetic at that point to the British, if you're skeptical of the growing resistance movement, then committees of safety look just like illegal institutions that have no business doing what they're doing. It's practically treasonous. But if you're sympathetic to the resistance movement because you believe the British government has grown wholly illegitimate, right? then these alternative committees aren't just acceptable. They're basically necessary because your view of the situation is that the existing governmental bodies, like the Albany Common Council, are completely illegitimate and are corrupt, right? And so, again, it comes down to sort of popular will. Did the majority of people in a given place agree with what the Continental Congress was doing, with the Articles of Association? And that's sort of where the committees drew their power in various places. If the people supported what was happening, then the committees of safety had a much easier time than if it was a more contested environment. Now, we've talked about the fact that the committees of safety were supposed to enforce the Continental Association or economic boycott of British goods. What coercive measures did these committees of safety take upon themselves or exercise as they were trying to enforce the Continental Association? So the mere fact that they exist freaks some people out. So when the Articles of Association are disseminated, copies are printed all throughout the colonies. And in fact, in many places, people literally sign them. So you'll have these huge lists of signatures on the bottom of the Articles of Association. New men who have really never been active in politics are signing them. Women are signing them. So the writing in some places is on the wall that this is going to be a popular measure. And in some of those cases, people who are not in favor of this just skedaddle because they don't want to find out what those coercive measures might be. In other places, people stick around. And so the battle of principles will sometimes become a battle of fists or arms. And so, you know, the kind of things we think about as sort of quaint revolutionary things are really violent, tarring and feathering, right? Riding people out of town on a rail, seizing property. All of these things slowly but surely become tools of the trade for these committees of safety. And that's how they, you know, gain the legitimacy that they didn't quite have in contested towns right away. Yeah, wow. If committees were seizing people's property and tarring and feathering them or even imprisoning them, they must have had a lot of popular support for their efforts. Yeah, I think the towns that can get away with that, they do. And that was evident to them 
by the sort of vast outpouring of support for the association. And, you know, you also got to imagine these are small towns. So people know who everyone is and they can sort of tell which way people are leaning. And so I think the committees sort of know when they can get away with it or when it's going to backfire. But I also think that it's a gamble in some sense because the problem with violence is people could you know support you in principle, but then they see the violent actions that an institution might take in service of those principles and that actually could turn them off. So there's a complicated calculus that I think the committees have to reckon with in each town, in each county, and in each colony overall. Now, earlier you noted that the committee was the basic building block of government during the American Revolution. And we've talked about committees of correspondence and committees of safety, and we even mentioned the modern day Committee on Committees in Congress. And I wonder whether revolutionary Americans established any other types of committees to govern their towns, colonies, and even states. They did. So I know most about New York. And so I'll just use New York as an example because they're pretty aggressive in creating innovative committees. Like I said before, the needs of the sort of resistance movement change over time. And with that change come changes in the committees. So New York, once the war gets going, creates two particularly noteworthy committees. One's called the New York Sequestration Committee. And they also create a committee on detecting and defeating conspiracies in the state of New York. So the Defecting and Defeating Conspiracies Committee comes from the premise that once the sort of revolution is really in motion, 1775, 1776, that non-allegiance is evidence of a conspiracy of treason, of efforts to undermine the revolutionary project, the legitimate will of the people. So once you're at war, what loyalism means changes. And so the New York Committee for Detecting Conspiracies has this power basically to root out who the loyalists are and to punish them and can send them to jail and things like that. So that threat colony-wide sends loyalists in many places sort of running away. And that's where the sequestration committee comes in. So the sequestration committee has the power to seize the property of known loyalists especially abandoned property. And of course, if you are a loyalist and you're living in fear of being tried and punished by the Committee for Defeating Conspiracies, you have a really good reason to just run away. And that's what many loyalists do. So they abandon their property. And then the sequestration committees, which are created by the then state of New York in counties where the patriots are in control, they seize that property, auction it off, and then send those proceeds back to the state. And so this is an important way in which the New York government, such as it was in 1776, 1777, and going forward, gains some power. And it's through, again, committees that they sort of authorize and request that the local counties create. And so they sell the property, right? So that raises revenue. It's the kind of policy that packs a punch. It scares loyalists off. It really criminalizes dissent in a meaningful way, taking people's property. And of course, to really ardent supporters of the resistance movement of the revolution, this is a kind of redistribution of property away from enemies of the state, in effect, and to the benefit of the revolutionary cause. So it makes New York seem pretty competent as a state government, you know, trying to win a revolution. Every town seemed to have a committee of some sort, a committee of correspondence, a committee of safety, or a committee for detecting and defeating conspiracies. Was there any sort of organizing or principal body that had oversight over all of these different committees or a body that tried to coordinate action between these committees? There are efforts, I would say, to coordinate is how I would put it. So as the revolution progresses or as the resistance turns into revolution and the action becomes not entirely localized in the towns, new bodies are created. So in 1774 and 1775 and 1776, A lot of colonies create what are called provincial congresses, which basically take on the old functions that the legislature had. And so those groups often would try and coordinate, set some policies for the various committees operating at the local level. And in certain cases, the local committees would sort of defer to those provincial congresses. Chris Minty, who's a historian who works at the Adams Papers at Massachusetts Historical Society, has done some work on the Brookhaven Committee of Safety in Long Island, New York shows that in some cases, when they were having trouble with loyalists, they would report to the provincial Congress asking for advice or help and so on and so forth. Beyond that, also in 1774, the Continental Congress right, comes into being and through things like the association dictates some changes in what the committees are doing. Right, That's partly where the transformation of a lot of committees of correspondence into committees of safety comes from. 
But it depends on a healthy degree of cooperation. Because if you think about it in a certain way, those higher authorities, if you want to call them that, the provincial congresses, the continental congresses, were ultimately created by people in the towns agreeing that there needed to be something else to try and coordinate resistance in this way. And so any semblance of organization really comes from cooperation more than anything else. So it was provincial congresses that really tried to coordinate action between committees within their colonies and later states. And as you just mentioned, there was also the first and second continental congresses, which seemed to try to coordinate action between the colonies. How did these local and provincial committees interact with the continental congresses? So in most cases, the provincial congresses were sort of in charge of sending delegates to the Continental Congress. So there's this sort of relationship between them that is formalized through individuals who go to the Continental Congress and then come back. And I think that in a lot of cases, the relationship runs through the individuals who move between various levels of action in the revolution. So in that sense, again, cooperation is sort of key because the Continental Congress only will work if the provincial congresses agree to send delegates. And so the Continental Congress's power oddly rests on a lower level of authority. And likewise, the provincial congress's authority depends on those sort of lower level committees and towns agreeing to send representatives to the provincial congress. And so the interactions, I think, again, are really driven by this sense of a common sort of project and individuals moving between various levels and who can speak to both groups and coordinate and know the limits of what a a local committee could do or what a provincial congress can accomplish in their given town or state and can sort of convey that to the continental congress. And so those kind of relationships between the institutions are key, but they run through individuals. How did the revolutionaries organize and coordinate intercolonial resistance to British policies? They began by forming local committees. As Mark related, committees served as the building blocks of government during the American Revolution. They proved relatively easy to organize, and they could be created and adapted to serve whatever needs the revolutionaries had. This is why the history of the American Revolution is filled with so many different committees. When the revolutionaries wanted to increase awareness of and interest in the imperial crisis, they created committees of correspondence. When they wanted to impose and enforce an economic boycott of British goods across British North America, they created committees of safety. When the revolution turned to war and it became especially important to figure out who stood with the revolution, who against it, and who hadn't made up their minds yet, the revolutionaries established committees for detecting and defeating conspiracies. And when the need to organize and coordinate action between all these different local committees arose, Local committees contacted each other and encouraged the election of delegates to form larger colony-wide committees like the provincial congresses, or still even larger intercolonial committees like the first and second continental congresses. As Mark noted, committees, large and small, local and distant, derived their power from the people. Revolutionary committees were designed to serve the needs and circumstances of the people. This is what made them so responsive to the revolutionaries' needs. And it was this responsiveness to the needs and circumstances of the people that allowed the committees to grow in size and power. It's how the committees were gradually able to assume the powers of local and provincial governments between 1775 and 1776. But what did coordinating intercolonial action and resistance look like? How did the revolutionaries create the governing bodies we always think of when we think about governance during the American Revolution, the Continental Congresses? And Why were there two Continental Congresses anyway? As always, we start our quest to discover more about the past with what seem like simple questions. And yet, our seemingly simple questions always lead us to form new questions. This is the fun of history. There's always more to discover and explore. So to answer our initial questions a bit further, how did the American colonies organize and coordinate intercolonial action? And how did intercolonial action pave the way for revolutionary governance at the local, colony, and intercolonial levels, as well as to answer our new questions about the formation of the First and Second Continental Congresses, we should speak with Benjamin Irvin, a professor of history at Indiana University Bloomington and the editor of the Journal of American History. Ben did a lot of research on the Continental Congresses in order to write his book, Clothed in Robes of Sovereignty, 
the Continental Congress and the people out of doors. But before we speak with Ben, I'd like to tell you about the sponsor for this episode, Care.com Senior Services. Mary Ball Washington enjoyed 12 years of marriage before her husband Augustine Washington died in 1743. During marriage, Mary and Augustine had five children, four sons and a daughter, the oldest of which was a boy named George. Mary Ball Washington never remarried. Her children grew up, married, and moved away, all while she continued to live on Ferry Farm. George Washington went on to do many great things, but he often thought about his mother. He worried for her because there were no family members on the farm to take care of her, and she needed help. In 1755, while he fought in the French and Indian War, George took time from the campaign to write his elderly mother. Honored madam, sorry it is not in my power to provide you with a Dutch servant or the butter you desired. We are quite out of that part of the country where either are to be had, there being few or no inhabitants where we not lie encamped, and butter cannot be had here to supply the wants of the army. Today, many people worry after their aging parents, like George Washington did after his aging mother, Mary. In fact, half of all American adults in their 40s and 50s are in the so-called sandwich generation, providing some manner of care, be it financial, emotional, or physical care, for their aging relatives. Like George, they want their aging relatives to be able to stay independent and in their own homes as long as possible. Eventually, George was able to convince Mary to move into a modest house he purchased for her near Fredericksburg, Virginia, right near the home of his sister, Betty Washington Lewis. But today, there's an easier way to provide personalized care for your aging loved ones in the comfort of their own home, a way that you can help them prepare their meals, run their errands, and keep their homes in order. That way is Care.com Senior Services, the world's largest online destination for finding and managing family care. Care.com helps millions of families find high-quality care for their loved ones, and finding that care costs less than you would think. Hiring an in-home senior caregiver saves money, as much as 50% compared to using a care agency. And Care.com makes paying for in-home senior care very easy. To learn more about how Care.com can help you care for your aging loved one and to save 30% off a Care.com premium membership, visit care.com slash bfworld. Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Now, as I may have mentioned, we're on a quest to discover more about governance in the American Revolution. Specifically, how the revolutionaries coordinated an intercolonial resistance to Great Britain, and how they created revolutionary governing bodies. We started our exploration at the local and provincial levels with committees of safety and correspondence and provincial congresses. Now, we'd like to explore governance at the intercolonial or continental level. So, would you tell us about the Continental Congress and how it formed? Sure, I'd be happy to. To understand the Continental Congress and its formation, you have to understand the events immediately preceding, specifically what we now know today as the Boston Tea Party. In December 1773, the people of Boston gathered at their wharf to dump a bunch of East India Company tea overboard. That, again, was December 1773. Then for months, they waited to hear what the response from England would be, what sort of punishment, if any, Parliament or the King would attempt to inflict upon them. And in late April and early May, they received the word they had dreaded. Parliament had enacted four pieces of legislation that we collectively know as the Coercive Acts. The Coercive Acts were intended to punish Bostonians for destroying the tea. And For this reason, Bostonians often refer to these acts as the intolerable acts. But the Coercive Acts did several things. They shut the Boston port to all Atlantic commerce. They literally closed down the sea trade of the city that depended so heavily upon it. They restructured the Massachusetts government, taking certain elections out of popular hands and imposing royal officials in a number of offices that had formerly belonged to the people of Massachusetts. They imposed new quartering requirements, allowing General Gage and his soldiers to occupy public buildings. And they created new laws for the administration of criminal justice. Essentially, they provided that a British officer who was charged with a capital offense could be tried elsewhere in the British Empire, as for example, in Nova Scotia. And this was essentially a provision designed to prevent the reoccurrence of future Boston massacre trials. 
So in December, they dumped the tea. In late April and early May, they received word that Parliament's punishment has been severe, and they immediately recognized the need for a Continental Congress. The reason for this is that the chief mechanism of patriot resistance was boycott. During the Stamp Act crisis of the mid-1760s, the merchants of British North America had begun to develop a boycotts and resistance to the Stamp Act. They had done so again in response to the Townsend Revenue Act of 1767, which imposed taxes on lead and glass and paint and tea. But these previous boycotts had always failed because they were locally implemented and locally enforced, and boycotts by their nature require widespread unity. So the purpose of the Continental Congress, which Massachusetts called for immediately after receiving word of the coercive acts, was to organize a boycott on a truly continental scale. Did Americans happen to see the first Continental Congress as a legal governing body, or was it simply just a body to organize this non-importation movement of 1774-1775? Legal, yes, in the sense, at least from the perspective of patriots, that they as freeborn Englishmen had a right to gather and discuss their rights and grievances and petition for the redress of the same. But governing, not exactly, not in the sense that a legislative body is governing. The Continental Congress had no power to enact or enforce laws and no power to impose or collect taxes. Essentially, this was a meeting of counselors and advisors who brought authority from their constituents to develop a consensus response to what they perceived to be British tyranny, but it was not a legislative body. To give you an example, the Colony of Connecticut issued instructions to its delegates to the First Continental Congress, and they characterized the Congress as, quote, a Congress of Commissioners rather than as congressmen as we think of today or legislators. Congress was expected to consult and advise and to strategize, but its purpose was not to govern per se. The compliance that Congress obtained was voluntary, not coerced in the way that a legislative body is empowered to coerce or impose its will. Now, how did the delegates to the First Continental Congress organize their new body? I mean, we're talking about representatives from 12 of the 13 colonies all arriving in Philadelphia to sit in this Congress. So what did they do when they got to the city? Well, the first order of business was to determine how to proceed. Most of the men who journeyed to Philadelphia had experience as either governors or colonial assemblymen. And so they were familiar with parliamentary procedure. In the first couple of days, they settled on two courses of action. First, they would meet in Carpenter's Hall. And second, that a local radical organizer by the name of Charles Thompson, who had not been elected to the Continental Congress, would serve as the secretary of the Continental Congress. And both of those decisions might fairly be interpreted as gestures of opposition to Joseph Galloway, who was the Speaker of the Pennsylvania House and who would have preferred that Congress instead meet in the Pennsylvania State House and who might have been unenthused about the prospect of Charles Thompson serving as Congress's secretary. And for that reason, Joseph Galloway imagined that there was a conspiracy afoot to suppress all conciliatory measures. Historians have somewhat disputed that. But the first thing that Congress did They chose Carpenter's Hall. They chose Charles Thompson. They elected Peyton Randolph of Virginia to serve as their president. Randolph's position should not be confused with the presidency or the executive office we understand in the United States today. He was going to serve more like a speaker of the House for this Continental Congress. And then finally, they decided that every state would be able to exert one vote in the Continental Congress. Instead of a national assembly where votes were distributed proportionate to population or wealth, every state would exercise a single vote. Once it had organized itself, what work did the First Continental Congress set out to accomplish? Did it meet solely to organize a continental boycott of British goods? One of the more extraordinary things about the Continental Congress, or perhaps one thing that we really need to understand if we want to know the Continental Congress, is that it was acting at the behest of and in response to 
popular patriot will. At the time that they elected delegates or appointed delegates to the Continental Congress in 1774, the various towns and communities and legislative bodies that were sending their delegates wrote up instructions or guidance for their representatives in the new Continental Congress. And they stated very clearly that they wished for the Congress to settle upon a course of political opposition to Britain. And so the Congress accomplished numerous things, but four particularly stand out. The Congress drafted a Declaration of Rights, a statement of principles, if you will. They asserted their natural right to life, liberty, and property. They asserted their constitutional right to gather and assemble and to petition for redress of grievances. They asserted their right to legislate for themselves because they could not be adequately represented in the British Parliament at such great distance. And they claimed that they submitted to the necessity of parliamentary trade regulation only out of necessity. They did not submit to parliamentary taxation. This was the Declaration of Rights. A second thing that the Continental Congress accomplished was it drafted a petition to King George. This petition included a statement of grievances, very much like the statement of grievances found in the Declaration of Independence written two years later. It included a plea for redress. The Continental Congress asked King George to intervene and protect the American people from an overbearing parliament and ministry. And finally, in conclusion, Congress affirmed its loyalty to King George III. Congress was not conceptualizing independence at this moment or certainly wasn't prepared to acknowledge it if it was. The third thing, arguably the most important thing that the Continental Congress did was to draft Articles of Association. And Articles of Association are the written rules and guidelines for the boycott that I alluded to earlier. The patriots of North America had been developing boycotts as a means of resisting parliamentary taxation from the mid-1760s. And it had become clear that what the moment needed in 1774 was not a series of local boycotts stitched together by a letter-writing campaign, but a truly centrally, continentally coordinated boycott. And this boycott was embodied in the Articles of Association. The Articles of Association included non-importation provisions. We will no longer import goods from Britain. Non-exportation provisions. We will no longer export our produce to Britain and non-consumption agreements. We will not buy things that were produced in Britain. Finally, number four, the Continental Congress drafted a series of addresses to the people of the colonies, to the people of the British Isles, to the province of Quebec, and to the provinces of St. John's and Nova Scotia and elsewhere to announce the purpose of their resistance and to deny any wish to inflict harm on persons elsewhere in the empire and to invite those who are so inclined to join them in their resistance movement. These were the chief accomplishments of the First Continental Congress in September and October of 1774. And just how effective was Congress in achieving its goals? I mean, how were these declarations, proclamations, and the association received? Well, to a certain extent, they were highly effective, but in other extents, they were less so. The Articles of Association met with widespread support among patriot communities, although it met with hostile opposition from loyalist pamphleteers and from persons disposed to believe that the boycotts were a bad idea, either merchants who did not want to sacrifice their business or stalwart proponents of parliamentary authority who thought that the boycotts were either disrespectful, if not unlawful. But for the most part, the Articles of Association received a rousing approval, or at least the loudest voices in the colonies were those of approval for the Articles of Association. On the other hand, Parliament and King George mostly ignored Congress's Declaration of Rights and petition to the king. Those documents, if you will, those forms of outreach to the king in parliament, those gestures of conciliation to the king of parliament, such that they were, were not well received in England. Now, as Ben noted earlier, the First Continental Congress adjourned in late October 1774. 
And the Second Continental Congress gathered in Philadelphia and convened in May 1775. Ben, why did Americans call for a Second Continental Congress? In essence, the call for a Second Continental Congress was baked into the First Continental Congress. Prior to its adjournment in October 1774, the First Continental Congress agreed to reconvene the following spring if British government had not granted redress for American grievances. And in fact, Parliament refused to formally acknowledge Congress's petition, and King George condemned the radicals in Boston who had published the Suffolk Resolves in which they expressed their intention to disregard the coercive acts and govern themselves. So as was increasingly apparent over the winter of 1774 and 1775, reconciliation seemed highly improbable, if not impossible. And so there was never, I don't believe, any real doubt that the Continental Congress would move again. It's also worth noting, one of the things I found fascinating when I was researching the Continental Congress is that during this adjournment between October 1774 and May 1775, when the putative position of the Continental Congress is one of reconciliation, in many colonies, the militia were beginning to prepare for war. There was a lot of military exercising, drilling happening at least as far south as Virginia up into New England. And so although Congress had adopted this conciliatory tone, it seemed quite clear that large segments of the American population were expecting the imperial conflict to deteriorate. In your research of the Continental Congress, did you find any differences in organization between the First and Second Continental Congresses? The most important difference between the First Continental Congress and the Second were the contexts in which they convened. The First Continental Congress gathered amidst a protracted imperial controversy. The Second Continental Congress assembled after the outbreak of war. The Second Continental Congress gathered in May 1775 in the immediate aftermath of the battles at Lexington and Concord. And one of their first pieces of business was to hear the testimony of persons who had witnessed those battles. In the weeks that followed through the summer of 1775, the Second Continental Congress resolved to establish a Continental Army and to appoint General Washington as its head. And to finance this army, Congress determined to print a paper currency. Once again, Congress had no power to tax, so it was just going to print money and hope that people would accept it and spend it. By the end of the year, 1775, Congress had also authorized secret negotiations with the French government. The Congress was seeking financial assistance, military assistance, specifically in the acquisition of weapons and gunpowder. So the start of the war really transformed the Continental Congress from a consulting body into a legislative and executive body, raising an army, issuing currency, conducting negotiations. These were the powers of a legislative and executive branch of government, and Congress in 1775 began to act like one. Raising and supplying an army, seeking foreign alliances, and figuring out how to finance everything seems like a lot to manage. Did the Second Continental Congress ever reach out to the various local and provincial committees to help them, you know, accomplish these tasks? Certainly, we find correspondence between members of Congress and the local committees established under the Articles of Association. But generally speaking, Congress did not supervise those committees' day-to-day operations. Those committees had clear directives. They understood what were their tasks. They were distant to Philadelphia in many cases, so oversight of day-to-day operations was really impractical. And there was also a level of governance between the local committees and the Continental Congress, and that was the provincial conventions that you mentioned. In colonies where royal governors disbanded or adjourned their colonial legislatures because those legislatures had expressed support for the Bostonians' resistance, the people elected representatives to gather for them in what became known as provincial conventions. These were essentially popular legislative assemblies, including many of the same individuals who had served in the House of Representatives or the House of Burgesses in the lawfully organized colonial assemblies 
but they were now meeting in a different location and calling themselves provincial conventions. And we see a lot of correspondence between the Continental Congress and the provincial conventions. Local committees could seek guidance or instruction from their provincial convention. The Continental Congress could consult with and give instructions, make requests of the provincial conventions. And so the provincial conventions are really best understood as the nexus between the local committees in Congress and the intermediary level of government between the two. And that would remain the case until after 1776, when the states begin to establish new constitutions and new state legislatures. We know that not all Americans were behind Congress, forming and assuming all the powers it needed to coordinate a war and revolution. And we also know that, just like today, there are opposing political viewpoints even among people who agree about all the actions that Congress should take. So, Ben, would you tell us whether there were any formal factions or nascent political parties within the Second Continental Congress? And if so, what those factions and political parties look like? Well, that's a wonderful question because a big chunk of the historical scholarship that has been produced on the Continental Congress is dedicated to answering it or attempting to answer it. And there are essentially two schools of thought. One may be attributed to a scholar by the name of H. James Henderson, who in 1974 published a book called Party Politics in the Continental Congress. So Henderson examined voting records in the Congress. Even though every colony had only one vote, every representative in the colony voted. So you knew where each representative stood. And Henderson counted those votes, and he discovered patterns within them, and he identified what he usually called blocks, not quite the same as the parties that we know today with their electoral apparatuses, but just loose factions of congressmen who commonly voted together. And over the course of the Continental Congress from its first convention in 1774 to its adjournment in the late 1780s, Henderson suggested that the Congress went through three phases. And in the first phase, the early years, Congress was dominated in large measure by what Henderson called an Eastern Bloc. Core to the Eastern Bloc were the Adams cousins, Samuel and John Adams, and their Virginia ally, Richard Henry Lee, also Patrick Henry, and later Thomas Jefferson. Henderson found an axis between the Adams and the Lees they tended to vote together. Later, around the 1780s, after the Adamses had returned to politics in Massachusetts or diplomatic service abroad, there emerged a middle state bloc, which was organized around nationalists such as James Duane from New York or James Madison of Virginia. And finally, in the mid-1780s, Henderson sees a division between Southern congressmen on the one hand, James Monroe of Virginia, Charles Pinckney of South Carolina, and Eastern congressmen, Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts, Lambert Cadwallader of New Jersey on the other hand. That's the Henderson school of thought. Henderson sees blocks within the voting patterns of Congress. The second school of thought may be attributed to a scholar by the name of Jack Graco, who in 1979 published The Beginning of National Politics. And Raykov argues that the political differences among members of Congress are frankly overstated. Raykov suggests that the members of Congress all adhere to certain basic Whig principles. They believed in balanced government. They believed in the right of representation. They believed that polities should have the right to govern and legislate and tax for themselves. Rako further argues that Congress's decision-making processes were mostly constrained by the limited range of options available to them. There wasn't a lot of wiggle room for the Continental Congress to maneuver. Continental Congress had no power to tax. Well, then if it wanted to raise an army, it had to issue a paper currency. So these sorts of limited options tended to mute over political differences according to Reiko. And it's a great, not fully resolved, fun to dispute kind of question, because the degree of political discord or harmony is in some ways a relative question compared to what we might ask. 
Do historians who subscribe to these two schools of thought, the Henderson School of Clear Voting Box and the Raykov School of Overstated Political Differences, do the scholars who subscribe to these two schools look at and interpret the same historical sources as they develop their ideas about what drove Congress? In general, I'd say they do look at the same sources. The primary sources for understanding the Continental Congress include the journals of the Continental Congress, the papers of the Continental Congress and the letters of delegates to Congress, but they employ different methodologies. Henderson was literally counting votes and arraying delegates by their votes. His book is full of tables of delegates and they're aligned or arrayed by the blocks with which they most consistently voted. I suspect Jack Rakove looked at all the same material that Henderson did, but his methodology is more interpretive, and I believe the word interpretive appears in his subtitle, An Interpretive History. And Rakove doesn't deny that these individuals voted in blocks. His argument is simply that the significance of these differences is artificially magnified by the distinctions in voting. In reality, most of these men, especially after 1775, when the loyalist Joseph Galloway no longer returns to Congress after 1776 when you have the Declaration of Independence. Most of these delegates are operating from a position of consensus. And Ben, what do you think about these schools of thought? Which argument and interpretation do you think is most plausible? As a reader of history, I am excited by intrigue and plot twists and cabals and things of that nature. And so I tend to align with Henderson, and perhaps that's a cynical disposition on my part. As a writer of history, that question was in many ways secondary or tangential to my own research. I was interested in the ways that Congress attempted to promote a national identity for the nation it was declaring into existence. And so I had the luxury of not needing to arbitrate between the Henderson and Rakov schools of thought. Yeah. Would you tell us more about how Congress promoted a national identity? Because as we happen to know from our discussion with other scholars about allegiances during the revolution, Americans were really divided over the revolution. Americans were very divided over the revolution, and they were also a very diverse set of people with Scots, Irishmen in the backcountry, Germans along the Appalachian Ridge, Englishmen, Quaker and Welsh, all identifying with the patriot cause of liberty, a large free and enslaved African American population, populations of indigenous peoples, loyalists. It was an extraordinarily eclectic population with diverse economic and political interests and identities. And it was one of Congress's tasks, although it was seldom a task they took up consciously, perhaps, but it was one of their tasks to forge a sort of an American identity for the new United States. And they did this in a variety of different ways that they borrowed from colonial tradition or from the sort of ceremonies of state of the British Empire from which they were all descended. The Continental Congress organized the first anniversary of independence celebration in July of 1777. They did not yet know to call it the 4th of July. There was some dispute whether it should be celebrated on the 2nd of July, the day that Congress had voted for independence, or the 4th of July, the day that they had adopted the declaration. Congress created swords, presentment swords, these were called, to honor valorous officers whom they could do so little to pay or compensate. They created medals for persons who had distinguished themselves in combat, and they created various icons for those medals. And in these sorts of ways, Congress attempted to achieve many purposes. Congress attempted to communicate to the American people a sense of collective pride and identity, a sense of Republican values. Congress attempted to, by these actions, behave in the way that other heads of state or governing entities behaved. 
right after Congress drafted the Declaration of Independence, John Adams wrote a private letter and said, we will sign this Declaration of Independence just as soon as a seal is prepared. We must have a seal with an emblem, the official symbol of state for the new United States. And because that's what kings and princes across Europe did. So were these symbols and seals successful in unifying Americans? The wonderful thing about seals and medals and celebrations is that they are inherently contested and contestable. Anybody can look at an emblem and offer an interpretation of what it means. Anybody can choose to salute a new flag or not to salute a new flag, to light candles in their windows on the anniversary of independence or not to light candles on their windows on the anniversary of independence. So even as Congress was attempting to create unifying symbols and ceremonies and celebrations, they were somewhat unwittingly in the process creating opportunities for loyalists or pacifists or persons committed by conscience not to participate. Often Quakers, for example, refused to light their windows as a matter of solemnity. And Congress provided these individuals an opportunity to distance themselves from the resistance movement. And so, for example, a loyalist by the name of Joseph Stansbury created poetry in which he derided Benjamin Franklin's emblems for the continental currency. An onlooker at one of the Continental Congress's anniversary of independence celebrations observed that the soldiers who marked on that day looked unhappy and barefoot. Some soldiers in the Continental Army, upon the announcement of a congressional fast day or Thanksgiving, it would have been asked privately amongst themselves. We haven't been fed in a year. What do we have to be thankful for? And so just as in our own time, the citizens of the United States argue over the meaning of statues, in the era of the revolution, the inhabitants of what was quickly becoming the United States quarreled amongst themselves over what to make of these new emblems of national identity. The Second Continental Congress undertook a lot of work, running a war, uniting a people, starting a country and trying to keep it going. If Congress started to meet in May 1775, how long did it sit for in its attempt to accomplish all that it set out to do? The Congress we know today as the Second Continental Congress sat from 1775 until 1781, excluding periods of brief adjournment when it was supplanted by the Congress of the Confederation, which convened from 1781 to 1789. These Congresses established bureaucratic infrastructures, military departments, fiscal departments that were capable of managing revolutionary business, or at least that attempted to manage revolutionary business with oversight from the congressional body. But By the establishment of these sort of bureaucratic infrastructures, the Second Continental Congress over the course of the late 1770s began to look a lot more like a national legislative and executive body. The Continental Congress began as a consulting body, a body that would outline the revolutionaries' positions on British rights and on the imperial crisis and one that would coordinate a non-importation, non-exportation, and non-consumption movement across the 13 British North American colonies. The call for a Second Continental Congress was embedded in the call for the First. As Ben described, members of the First Continental Congress agreed to reconvene the following spring if the British government had not redressed their grievances. By the following spring, spring 1775, it had become clear. Neither King nor Parliament would redress the revolutionaries' grievances. And the battles of Lexington and Concord on April 19 proved that the British Empire stood prepared to wage war against the revolutionaries. Where the First Continental Congress had been a consulting body, the Second Continental Congress, which convened in May 1775, sat as a legislative and executive body. As such, the Second Continental Congress raised an army, issued a currency to equip and pay for that army, began negotiating with France for military assistance and a possible alliance against Great Britain and undertook work to unite Americans as a separate and distinct people from Great Britain. 
This was a lot of work. How did Congress manage it all? What were its inner workings like that allowed them to accomplish all their goals? And was this third Congress, the Confederation Congress, which saw the fledgling United States through the end of its war for independence, different from the Second Continental Congress? We need an inside view of Congress, and fortunately, there's a way to get one. There was a man whose experiences would be revealing, as he served in the Second Continental Congress and wrote the initial draft of the Constitution that paved the way for the new Confederation Congress. That man was John Dickinson of Pennsylvania and Delaware. So before we conclude our quest, let's consult with one more historian, Jane Calvert. Jane is an associate professor of history at the University of Kentucky. Her first book, Quaker Constitutionalism and the Political Thought of John Dickinson, used John Dickinson as a way to explore Quaker ideas about government and protest during the American founding. And she's also the director of the John Dickinson Writings Project. So one last time, let's return to the halls of the earliest Congresses of the United States. Jane, we've been exploring local committees in the Continental Congress to better understand governance during the American Revolution. And now that we have an overview of those bodies, we'd like to know more about their inner workings. John Dickinson, a revolutionary you study extensively, seems like he would make a great window onto how Congress worked from the inside. So would you tell us who John Dickinson was and how he came to serve in the Continental Congress? Dickinson was America's first political celebrity. Before Americans in the Atlantic world knew much about George Washington or Benjamin Franklin as political figures, they were toasting Dickinson's health. He started making a reputation for himself as a legislator in Pennsylvania and from his writings against the Stamp Act in the early 1760s, with his letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania, the first of which were published 250 years ago this December, he launched to international fame and notoriety as the spokesman for the American cause. It was because of his reputation that he came to serve in the First Continental Congress, but he almost missed it. His chief political rival in Pennsylvania, Joseph Galloway, maneuvered to keep him from winning a seat in the assembly, which meant he couldn't join Congress until he got reelected in October. So he wasn't there until the end, but his reputation was such that his not holding a seat didn't really matter. He worked for it on the outside. He wrote the instructions to the delegates to Congress from Pennsylvania, and then six documents that the first Congress ultimately produced, Dickinson wrote four of them. Although most historians have dismissed him because he wasn't sitting, his influence can be clearly seen on Congress's very first act, the Suffolk Resolves, which prescribed how Massachusetts should resist the new royal government headed by Thomas Gage. These resolves determined that they should resist peacefully, ignoring offending laws and instead adhere to their former charter. And this follows exactly the course that Dickinson had been prescribing since his writings on the Stamp Act 10 years earlier. After the passage of the Townsend Act in 1767, Massachusetts had been following Dickinson's lead on resistance. The circular letter that they sent to the colonies in 1768 requesting unity and resistance echoed Dickinson's language in the farmer's letters. So a strong case can be made that Dickinson was the foremost figure of the founding era. He was the only leader who was present and active in America from the beginning of the conflict through and beyond the ratification of the Constitution. He wrote more than any other figure for the cause, including most of the publications of all the Congresses he attended, beginning with the Stamp Act. Before independence, he was the most widely known American political figure, and he wielded more power than any other. He also made seminal contributions, including shaping how Americans resisted, defining and articulating American rights, and working to build the national and state governments. Would you tell us more about what John Dickinson was like as a representative for Pennsylvania and Delaware in Congress? You know, so we can get a better idea of how delegates from other colonies represented the views and concerns of their constituents and colonies. Delegates did the best they could to gauge the sentiment of their constituents and act according to their wishes. This was not easy in an era without polls or modern means of communication. They received reports from committees of Congress, resolutions from their home assemblies, reports from public meetings convened to ratify measures of Congress, correspondence from home, and they watched carefully for signs of popular unrest. Dickinson, for his part, felt conscience-bound by his constituents, who were predominantly Quakers and their pacifist supporters. He therefore worked as hard as he could, not just to keep the peace between Britain and the colonies, but also to prevent separation. 
which the Quakers and Dickinson feared because it could mean the loss of their religious liberty protected by their charter. So in Congress, because of the diversity of opinion, there were definitely factions in both Congresses, although they were much less pronounced in the first than in the second. There were what we might loosely term radicals, moderates, and conservatives. But we should be very careful how we understand and use these terms. They bear no resemblance, really, to any political positions or parties that we have today and should be considered only as a way to describe where delegates stood on the question of war and independence. Dickinson was the leader of the moderate faction, which dominated the first Congress. His position never changed throughout the course of the debate, but the sentiment around him did. The Adams cousins, John and Samuel, along with Virginians such as Richard Henry Lee, led the radical faction leading towards extreme measures. Those stridently against extreme measures were led by Joseph Galloway of Pennsylvania and New Yorkers John Jay and James Duane. In an era where reputation could make or break a gentleman's credit, both financial and political, one person could exert a disproportionate influence in a body like Congress. From the beginning of the first Congress until the spring of 1776, Dickinson was the person whose public reputation was the highest. When sentiment within Congress turned solidly towards war after the publication of Payne's Common Sense, Richard Henry Lee and John Adams took the lead at that point. But even then, Dickinson's stature was such that they couldn't disavow his position entirely or reject him because if he left Congress, the public might abandon their support for it. So he continued to play a pivotal role right up until the very end of the debate over independence. So you're John Dickinson and you've been elected to serve Pennsylvania in the Continental Congress. What does your day-to-day routine look like? How did Congress function on a day-to-day basis? Well, unfortunately, the record is very sparse on the internal functioning of the Congress. We only catch little glimpses from the correspondence of the delegates or scraps of notes. From what the committees did, however, it's clear that for the most part, they worked very well together. They submitted their work to one another for emendation and revision. And sometimes there was grumbling, but for the most part, they laid their egos and particular agendas aside to do what was best for the cause. And Congress as a whole, they were really concerned with American unity because that was really the most precarious thing. We have to remember that the colonies were very diverse. They differed from one another in their priorities and what they wanted from this. And so maintaining public confidence in their work was their priority. And they strove for what we would today call bipartisanship. In other words, individuals worked hard not to alienate those with whom they disagreed. And on the contrary, they attempted to craft measures that could get support from all factions. They were not successful in keeping some extreme members from leaving. For example, after Joseph Galloway's plan of union was rejected, he left Congress and became a loyalist. But Dickinson never left until he was voted out by Pennsylvania radicals after the Declaration of Independence. You mentioned Congress's committees, and Dickinson served on a lot of them. And some of the committees he served on were actually the really prominent ones. So would you take us through how these congressional committees worked by telling us about Dickinson's work on one of these committees, like the committee to draft the Declaration for Taking Up Arms in July 1775? This is, again, where the historical record just doesn't speak to us. We just don't have very much to go on. The Declaration on Taking Up Arms was part of a near final effort by the moderates to avert war. After hostilities became open in the spring of 1775, the primary purpose of Congress shifted from working for reconciliation to preparing for war. But Dickinson's extensive notes for a speech he gave in May show us that the moderates had not given up on reconciliation and averting bloodshed. Dickinson persuaded the radical members who were growing increasingly restless to issue this document along with another called the Olive Branch Petition, both of which embodied the dual purposes of Congress. The most obvious reason that Dickinson became the primary draftsman of both documents after others had made their attempts is simply that not only were these documents his idea, but he was also seen as the most effective writer. There's a reason that historians have dubbed him the penman of the revolution, despite the fact that all of his work was to prevent revolution. 
What confuses many people who don't know Dickinson's political thought and priorities is how he could have written both a document that is humble, supplicative, and pleading for reconciliation, and a document that is bellicose and saber-rattling. And the answer is that he was trying in every way possible to prevent war. You can think of it like this. If you've ever seen two cats about to fight, they puff up to twice their size and scream at each other in hopes that the other will back down. This is because when cats actually engage, they do such damage to each other that mutual death is a real possibility. So Dickinson explained that his goal with the declaration and the bellicose language that he added to Jefferson's draft, all of this was bluffing, by the way, but he included this language to, as he put it, produce such apprehensions in the British that they would think twice about attacking America. Now, Dickinson was not a Quaker. He was what they call a fellow traveler. He was raised by a Quaker mother to whom he had been very close. His wife was a devout Quaker. And until recently, he lived in her house with her female Quaker relatives. And the political culture of Pennsylvania was pervaded by Quakerism. His whole life, he shared their priorities, including what we might call a pragmatic pacifism, commitment to religious liberty, and basic rights for subordinated peoples, black, slaves, women, Native Americans, the poor, and prisoners. So his Quaker values likewise pervaded his political writings, and the Olive Branch Petition is a clear example. Quakers later cited the Olive Branch Petition when attempting to convince their persecutors that they were patriotic. And as to the question that many people ask about whether Dickinson was a loyalist, he's often portrayed as such by representations in entertainment, such as the musical 1776, that's a classic that people often cite, also the HBO miniseries on John Adams, but also scholars who are interested in presenting a simplistic picture of the lead up to independence. It makes a good story. It's easier to tell. And the public tends to like a black and white picture, clear cut, good guys and bad guys. But Dickinson was a thoroughgoing patriot. He simply disagreed with the radical faction about the best way to secure American rights and liberties. He believed with good reason that these would be best protected under a British constitution. And he also knew that America was entirely unprepared for independence or war with the greatest power on the planet. We have the benefit of hindsight in that we can see how the events of the American Revolution turned out. But of course, the people who lived in the moment didn't know how the revolution would end. So, Jane, would you tell us more about the Olive Branch petition and the kind of support Dickinson had for that petition? Well, he certainly had to make a case for it. He gave a very long speech in Congress in May, for which we have his notes, and he laid out all of the possibilities of how Congress and how Americans could respond to Britain. And he said very clearly that measures for peace and reconciliation had to go hand in hand with measures for war. So he was not naive. He did not have his head in the sand about what was necessary. And he did have a substantial faction that was still behind him, including Maryland and New York and a number of Pennsylvania delegates as well, including James Wilson. So he proposed the Olive French Petition and John Jay crafted a version of it. And then Dickinson came in and revised it. And his version was the one that was used. And it more or less begged the king to rescue the colonists from a parliament that was out of control. And it was very humble, and it spoke in the very traditional language that colonists use to their king. And then the declaration on taking up arms was supposed to be the deterrent, sort of the carrot and the stick that the colonists were using with Britain to try to resolve the matter in the most peaceable way possible. So the radical members of Congress grudgingly put up with this, grudgingly issued these two statements in concession to Dickinson's reputation and his influence. They knew they had to work with him, otherwise he might leave and Congress would fall apart. I doubt he would have left, but it was something that they considered. When those things did not work, Dickinson and his allies, such as James Wilson, continued to press for measures of reconciliation well into 1776. And we have further notes where Dickinson proposed a delegation going to Britain 
to treat with members of parliament and to try to meet with people who could hear them. But of course, we know that there were no further issuances from Congress and no delegation ever formed and was sent, even though Dickinson and his allies wanted to pursue reconciliation. The last was in the summer of 1775. Jane, how did the influence or individual reputations of congressmen like John Dickinson impact how Congress actually received and debated drafts of their work? Would you tell us how Congress received Dickinson's draft of the Declaration for Taking Up Arms or the Olive Branch Petition? Well, Congress dealt with the work it received by the committees in an orderly manner. For decades now, the members of Congress, who were in most cases members of their provincial assemblies, they had practiced for decades working in their provincial assemblies, governing themselves. And so they did the same thing in Congress. They received the committee's findings and they debated their work and members motioned for and voted on changes in documents. And eventually, if they approved the final product, they voted to have it published. Unfortunately, there are few specifics about Congress's reaction to the declaration or the Olive Branch petition. They certainly read the documents and they compared drafts. We have that in the journals of Congress. We do know, as I said, that many members were not interested in issuing either of these. It would have been wonderful if we had notes of their debates like we do for the federal convention, but unfortunately we don't. So we know that they supported it, but it was grudging. And Dickinson had his allies in Maryland and New York, but this was the last concession to the moderate faction that Congress made. Now, John Dickinson didn't actually vote for independence. He told the rest of the Pennsylvania delegation to vote their consciences, and he personally abstained from the vote because he wanted it to be unanimous. But Dickinson did help the United Colonies prepare for independence. Jane, would you tell us about the Articles of Confederation and the role John Dickinson played in drafting what became the first constitution of the United States? He absolutely did prepare the country for independence. In the first place, defining their rights and giving them a clear sense of an independent identity from Britain. In fact, his enemy, probably his greatest political enemy over the course of his life, John Adams, believed that the delay of the Declaration of Independence was crucial for America's successful revolution. Unfortunately, Dickinson's work writing America's First Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, met with less success. He almost single-handedly drafted the Articles of Confederation in June of 1776 in anticipation of the vote on independence. Again, there are no records from the drafting committee except for Dickinson's cryptic notes and a line from Edward Rutledge of South Carolina to John Jay to the effect that Dickinson was too concerned with refining the draft as though a constitution could be too perfect. We know that he had Benjamin Franklin's 1775 draft in front of him, but he didn't follow it closely. Instead, what he had learned from his study of the law from other constitutions, in particular Pennsylvania, was his main model and his Quaker culture to write something that really is quite striking. There are several provisions worth noting. First, he provided for a strong central government to replace the one that Americans were losing, the British government. He knew that American Union was not perfect and it would need a strong centralizing force to hold it together. Second, he provided protection for religious liberty. In this clause, he also did something remarkable. He wrote the first ever gender inclusive language in an Anglo American constitution to protect women's religious liberty. Importantly, he wanted their practice of religion to be protected. And because of the many women in his life, he knew that for Quaker women to practice religion meant to preach publicly. So this was an early clause for freedom of speech for women. He also provided protections for Native Americans, which was a lifelong concern of his. And finally, he queried his colleagues about adding a clause outlawing slavery. Some of Dickinson's clauses sound more like 20th and 21st century ideas than 18th century ideas. So how did Congress receive Dickinson's draft of the Articles of Confederation with its radical gender inclusive language? Uh, We don't know. The details of the debate over the articles are lost to us. There are no records. But we can tell clearly that they did not like any of these really quite radical provisions. They excised all of these provisions from the final draft. 
that was ratified in 1781. And the government that the final Articles of Confederation created was decentralized, weak, and notoriously ineffective. The key clause is the second one, which says, each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence, and every power, jurisdiction, and right which is not by this confederation expressly delegated to the United States and Congress assembled. The problem then, of course, was that the Congress was given virtually no powers, and the states pretty much did what they wanted without regard to one another or the union. They didn't pay taxes, they had different currencies and trade regulations, and they squabbled over boundaries while Congress looked on helplessly. Yeah, I know from my bit of research into the Articles of Confederation that Dickinson really did provide for a strong national government, but the final version of the first constitution really does reflect a preference for a national government that's beholden to the states for its power. Right, absolutely. It was quite different. And again, unfortunately, we don't have any record of Dickinson's commenting on the revised articles, but it's pretty clear that he believed that they were ineffective and needed to be revised. This didn't stop him, however, from trying his best as president, first of Delaware and then of Pennsylvania, to make the Articles of Confederation as they were ratified work. He spent much time trying to get his state assemblies to pay their taxes, and he dealt with a long-running boundary dispute between Pennsylvania and Connecticut, and he also urged the Pennsylvania delegates to Congress to deal honorably and fairly with Native Americans. So he did try to implement the policies or the provisions that he put forth in his first version of the Articles, but the Confederation was structured in a way that it just was unworkable. What did this unworkable type of government structure look like in practice? I mean, if Congress was in charge of directing the war effort and of putting the new nation together, if the states held most of the power, what did that all look like? Well, it sort of depended on your vantage point. Some people thought it was just right and didn't need any fixing. What they liked was that they had extracted themselves from this all-powerful central government in Britain that was attempting to control everything at the colony level. After the Stamp Act was repealed and Congress put forth its Declaratory Act, they stated that Parliament had the power to legislate for the colonies in all cases whatsoever. This was a line that was repeated over and over again in the resistance literature leading up to independence. So many Americans believe that the Articles of Confederation were just fine and the state should be able to manage their own affairs and this would inculcate virtue in the populace. But there is an adage that when the pot boils, the scum will rise. And so the revolution was like a boiling pot. And the scum rising to the top was the quote-unquote lower sorts of men who had no virtue. They were not gentlemanly in the sense that they did not have sort of independence in a very basic sense. And they were uneducated. They were unschooled in the law. And they were rising up the ranks of the states to control them. And they were self-interested men as opposed to disinterested men. So they were out to sort of line their own pockets rather than looking out for the welfare of the whole. And this led to a very precarious situation in the states. And what really sort of signaled to many leaders like Dickinson that the whole confederation could just collapse were uprisings like Shays Rebellion. And so this is what prompted a number of the colonies to convene the Annapolis Convention, of which Dickinson was president. And it's very interesting that he was named president because he, of course, had been the one to write the original version of the articles. And he was the elder statesman in this convention, which met, of course, in Annapolis in 1786. Only a few states sent delegates, and it was more or less a meeting to just establish that they could do nothing and that there needed to be another convention by all of the states to figure out what to do about the Articles of Confederation. The result of the Annapolis Convention was that Dickinson's letter that he wrote went to Congress and in February of 1787. And his letter called for a federal convention to begin in May. And at the federal convention, 
he tried to implement his two priorities from his version of the Articles of Confederation. First, he supported a strong federal government, and it was his suggestion to have one branch of Congress represent the people and the other represent the states. And this was the basis of what became the so-called Connecticut Compromise. Second, he put forth the motion that became Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution for the abolition of the Atlantic slave trade in 1808. Again, he wanted more. By this time, Dickinson had freed all of his own slaves and had become an abolitionist. But his colleagues, again, wouldn't concede. Congress managed a lot of its work with committees and with congressmen trying to work in such a way that no member felt alienated. As Jane pointed out, this is how John Dickinson managed to get Congress to allow him to draft both a declaration for taking up arms, which outlined the colonists' reasons for bearing arms against their king and government, and the Olive Branch Petition, which beseeched King George III to rescue his colonists from an out-of-control parliament. John Dickinson was able to draft these documents on the behalf of Congress, in part because no one wanted to alienate him. Now, Congress proved as effective as it was in its work because the men who served in the Continental and Confederation Congresses were experienced legislators. In many cases, they had served for years in the assemblies of their home colonies before they joined Congress. And although we don't have detailed records about the work they conducted inside individual congressional committees, we do know that these congressmen did their best to work together to benefit the cause. Now, in terms of the Confederation Congress that took over for the Second Continental Congress in 1781, It was established by the Articles of Confederation, the first constitution of the United States. Congress wrote the Articles in response to the need for the United States to establish a government independent of Great Britain, and they crafted the Articles in response to what the revolutionaries saw as the all-controlling, powerful central government of Parliament. Americans were waging a revolution and war against this powerful government, so why would they want to create a powerful government of their own and risk the chance of having to fight all over again? This is what many Americans thought. This is why the Articles of Confederation provided for a weak, decentralized government where the states held most of the power. Americans wanted to keep an eye on their government and keep it responsive to their needs and desires, and they believed that they could be most watchful if they kept as much power as possible within their states. Which brings us back to how the revolutionaries set up their initial governing bodies. They started by forming local committees that were responsive to the needs of the people but it proved hard to keep government powerful and responsive to the people on the national level. So the questions for Americans became, how do you establish a government that is both responsive to the needs of the people and to the needs of the nation? And how do you unite 13 disparate states and keep them together in a union? John Dickinson believed that the answer lay in a strong government. A strong government would both keep the states united and protect the people's individual rights. Now, because we know how the American Revolution turned out, We also know that many Americans would come around to some of John Dickinson's ideas regarding a powerful central government. However, in the moment, in the early and mid-1780s, many Americans puzzled over these questions, and it would take them until 1789 to settle on a course of action to solve them. Look for more information about our guests, their publications, and notes for this episode on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 153. You need to download the OI Reader app. It's a free app that contains not only 30 minutes of extra audio I had to cut from the interviews you just heard, but also a lot of different historical resources about revolutionary committees and congresses that you can explore to further your knowledge. Again, the OI Reader app is free, and it's available for all your favorite iOS and Android devices. So visit your favorite app store or visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OI Reader to download the app. Today's episode is part of our Doing History to the Revolution series, and it was brought to you by the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture and Care.com Senior Services. For more information about how you can care for your aging loved one and save 30% off a Care.com premium membership, visit care.com slash bfworld. Finally, I'm curious about what further questions you have about governance during the American Revolution. If you still have questions, send them to me and I'll see what I can do about sending you an answer or crafting a future episode to answer it. So send your questions to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet them to at Liz Covart, or post them in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, 
Never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.